Um, very well, thanks everybody for attending the morning session of the second day of uh, the 2021 edition of uh, ICGT. Uh, just a short announcement saying that if you go to the official webpage on ICGT 2021 and the online program, you will also find the PDF of the book of the proceedings freely available for the next month. Okay, so please go there and uh, check out. Even that, as I said, thanks everybody for attending this uh, morning. I'm very, very, very happy to meet uh, um, just Peter Caton, who is going to talk to us about verification conquest reliability analysis. I don't really think that there is any need on my part to introduce Jos Peter is one of the driving force behind the, the whole model checking community. Uh, the author of, uh, with Crystal Bayer, what is considered the Bible of <laughs> model checking. And uh, <clears throat> so we are, I can just say that we are very, very happy to have uh, Jos Peter here. And uh, please go ahead. And thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, introduction, uh, Fabio. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I would first Perfect, like, like to thank uh, thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, to give a talk at uh, ICGT. And um, as Fabio is already announcing, I'm, I want to uh, yeah use this hour to explain you a bit uh, how. Uh, let's say formal verification can be used to yeah a kind of traditional field namely reliability analysis and uh, the model that i'm going to use and that i'm going to explain you later is a model of uh, fault trees and a specific version of uh, fault trees and they are used a lot actually in safety and nowadays even uh, security and also in particular reliability engineering the idea is that uh, you basically model your system in a top-down way. You start with very simple components. Those components can fail, so there can errors can occur. Those errors are subject to a certain uh, probability distribution. So with a certain probability, a certain system component will fail, let's say, within one hour or within two months or within three years. And then the whole idea of this uh, fault tree is that you do a, a failure analysis of the whole system based on how the system is composed of the subcomponents. And uh, actually this is used in uh, many application areas, uh, not only nuclear, I mean energy, for instance, nuclear power plants, which you see on the right, but also uh, in transportation, um, trains, aerospace, airways, um, fault trees are used in, in many, many applications. And if you Google, you will find many handbooks uh, for different applications. So for instance, in a nuclear power plant uh, area, you have a handbook of using fault trees uh, for analyzing, uh, let's say, the uh, reliability of uh, nuclear power plants. So what is uh, reliability engineering? Just to try this to capture on one slide. Yeah, it ensures that uh, certain critical assets, and you think about medical devices, uh, the examples I showed you before, they operate uh, safely. And one of the most prominent techniques, there are definitely more techniques, but uh, one of the most prominent techniques in this area is what they call fault tree analysis. And this is used by many uh, industries and many companies. Um, for instance, NASA is actually formally requiring to do a fault tree analysis uh, as part of the design of their systems. Uh, the same to the European Space Agency, uh, Airbus, um, all these companies uh, basically have in their design process, uh, one of the, let's say, mandatory steps is to do actually this fault tree analysis. And they're actually depending on the application, their industrial standards um, that actually uh, uh, enforce uh, or strongly recommend, it depends a bit on the level of criticality, uh, the use of these fault trees. So for instance, if you look at nowadays uh, autonomous cars, uh, there is this ISO 262626 uh, tool, and, and uh, that actually also uh, actually strongly recommends to use uh, fault tree analysis. 
Um, I like this uh, a tweet by Elon Musk uh, a couple of years ago. So, of course, uh, you all know Elon Musk. Uh, he was he's involved in this SpaceX, uh, uh, let's say, mission. And they had a tryout in, uh, in 2015 on the Falcon 9 uh, missile. And uh, that went, uh, yeah, completely wrong. So he wrote there, there was an overpressure event in the upper state's liquid oxygen tank. And the data suggests some counterintuitive cause. And that's all we can say with confidence right now. And we will have to more say following a four or fault tree analysis. And so this launch actually failure costed him uh, about a quarter of billion dollars. And he said, well, we have to analyze this more carefully uh, using, using fault trees. Um, so what are fault trees? Fault trees have been developed uh, by, uh, yeah, uh, in the early 1960s. So it's basically a directed acyclic graph. And the way I intuitively, I see it as a kind of a Boolean circuit. So actually what you have, you have events. They are indicated by your circles and they are the smallest components of your system. So those can fail with a certain probability distribution. They can fail. And then these failures propagate through this directed acyclic graph. As I would say, an input signal propagates through a circuit. So if you, for instance, look at this uh, K out of M gate, it means that this gate is going to fail. So this output is going to race. Yeah, if K inputs, uh, so for instance, this input and that input have also failed. So if here are those, uh, let's say events, and if two of them have failed, and we have a two out of N uh, elements, then the output will fail indeed if two of the children of this gate have failed. Now, special cases thereof are AND and OR gates. You also have something like an inhibitor, and that's basically it. So you have those basic events, and then what we will see, we also have some kind of intermediate events. But what is now the purpose of such a di rooted directed acyclic graph? It's actually to compute uh, when does the root of the graph, what they call the top level event, actually is going to fail. I mean, the top level, I mean, the whole system is the whole tree, the whole graph is supposed to model the whole system. So if the root of the tree actually fails, it means the whole system fails. And that's actually a catastrophe, right? That's what you would like to avoid. So the way here is, is an example, uh, actually you see three times the same example of uh, what is called a static fault tree. So this kind of Boolean circuit and uh, how people analyze this is uh, using what is called a minimal cut set. So what's a cut set? It's a set of components that together can cause the system to fail. So here you see this OR element over here. Uh, so it means that if this one will fail, one of the children of the ORs fails, and that means that the whole system will fail because the top level event, this inhibitor will, will basically also fail. So that's a cut set. And this actually is even a minimal cut set because no proper set is also a cut set. The same you see here. I mean, here, if those three components would fail, then uh, this uh, will fail. This will propagate here. The two OR elements will fail. That is propagate to this AND element. This AND element will fail. Then this OR element will fail. And then basically the whole tree will fail. So also those three together are a cut set, but this is not a minimal cut set because this is a two out of three gate. So actually it would suffice that only two out of those three children would fail. So in this situation, actually we have a minimal cut set. So these circuits are actually, or these static fault trees are very easily to analyze. So if you have, let's say the example again, same example on the left, if you would like now to analyze uh, what are, let's say, uh, what is the probability that uh, let's say the whole system, the top level event will fail, then the only thing you have to do is basically a Boolean calculation over this fault tree. There is some echo somewhere. Um, and there are two ways to do that. You can either do this top down or you can do this bottom up. I don't go through the details here. The message, what I want to say is you can do this very efficiently using BDDs. 
So if you look at tools, if you look at techniques for static fault trees, they heavily, uh, let's say, use uh, BDDs. Uh, though by BDDs, you calculate those minimal cut sets, and then you do a kind of probability calculation on top of those. The point is that those static fault trees that were developed in the 1960s, they have many deficiencies. So they're way too simple for, for practical systems. And they lack all kind of, let's say, uh, uh, dependability patterns. For instance, uh, think about uh, your car. Your car typically has four tires. If one of the tires fails, then you typically have a spare somewhere in the back of your car. And you can replace one of the, let's say, failed uh, tires by this spare. So you have this kind of spare management. Well, this you cannot model easily or model with static fault trees. So there is a need actually to introduce a kind of extra gate. So they have this, uh, what is called sometimes a spare gate. And this looks like this. So it may be the case that this is uh, your tire. Uh, and here there is a spare, yeah. Uh, this spare may maybe fail with a lower rate because it's currently not in use. And it means that if this one now fails, it can be replaced by the spare. And actually this can generalize it may be the case that you do not have only one spare, but you can have several spares and so forth. Well, this is typically that you cannot model by static fault trees. And then there are things like redundancies, functional dependencies. So there are many, let's say, dependability patterns or patterns in reliability that those static fault trees do not support. So the bottom line is that for those static fault trees, the top level, the, the root of your directed acyclic graph only depends on the set of failed uh, events, those cut sets, but not on the temporal ordering of those events. Uh, it didn't, I mean, in my analysis before, it was not relevant in which order, let's say, the children, uh, the leaves of my graph were actually failing. So people came up with, with different, uh, let's say, remedies uh, to, to the static fault trees. So in the literature, if you look around, there are state event fault trees, there are Boolean-driven Markov processes, there are attack trees, they're actually used in security, there are even attack defense trees, there are SD fault trees, and so forth. So there are many different, actually, extensions of these static fault trees since many years. And the model I'm going to focus on are the endemic fault trees developed by uh, John Dugan from uh, uh, Virginia. Uh, she developed uh, uh, those dynamic fault trees in uh, the early 90s. Um, and uh, well, her quote is that uh, this uh, dynamic fault tree analysis has extended the state of the art and the state of practice in analyzing the dependability of computer systems. And indeed, if you Google dynamic fault trees, you get many, many hits. Um, so what's a dynamic fault tree? It's again a rooted directed acyclic graph. We have the same ingredients as before, but now we have extended this with a bunch of new gates, it's so to speak. So one of the gates is, for instance, this pant gate. And this pant gate says, suppose that this is a pant gate with two children. It says it's a, it's a kind of an ant, so both children have to fail, but also there is an ordering, namely the ordering is that they need to fail in order from left to right. Um, similarly, you have this spare that I mentioned before, which is here on the left. And there are things like uh, functional dependencies, which basically means if this input will fail, it's called a trigger, then actually this will automatically trigger the failure of something else. And even you may attach a probability to this uh, and this is called a dependency. So what is a dynamic fault tree? It's a static fault tree plus a bunch of extra, let's say, mechanisms to induce orderings and to model, let's say, dynamic um, reconfigurations of your system. And the, the tool, and then the tool is the baseline that I'm going to use. Uh, this has been the standard in analyzing reliability uh, models using DFTs has, is Galileo. And this tool was developed, I think, a bit later uh, end of the uh, 1990s. So here is an example of a dynamic fault tree. It models a cardiac assist system. So what you see is the, the events on the bottom, the C, S, 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 P, and B, and so on. And then there are certain dependencies. So maybe I zoom into the motor unit, uh, which is the, the unit over here. So this motor unit consists of two components, a switching unit, and this is a pant gate. 
So this will fail if MS fails before MA fails. And the idea is basically that MS is a kind of switch. And suppose that uh, this component will fail. And if the switch is still active, then the switch allows basically the replacement of MA by MB. Oops. But if the switch has failed, then actually the, the whole uh, motor has failed because thanks to this OR element, if the switching unit fails, then actually the switching mechanism is not active anymore. And then actually, uh, uh, if the switching has failed and this MA has failed, it means that the whole engine has failed because you cannot switch from MA to MB. There are several other mechanisms that you see. So here you see, for instance, two spare elements. Uh, those two air spare elements actually share the same replacement. And that uh, is a phenomenon that we're going to see later. So if PA is actually failing, if this is failing, then actually they both can be replaced by this thing, but you can imagine then there is a certain race uh, because we only have one tire as a replacement. So who is going to, uh, to be able to use that replacement? Good. Those uh, graphs can be, uh, can be very large. So in practice, uh, don't be surprised that those fault trees have hundreds of elements uh, and, and are much more complex than this uh, toy example I showed you here. Now, what's the price of dynamic fault trees? Well, the point is that the analysis can no longer be done using those minimal cut sets. Um, so you cannot just do this analysis using BDDs. Now, you can try to analyze then rather sets sequences because the order seems to be important. That is, turns out to be insufficient. Um, so the DFT behavior is history dependent and actually you have to keep track of this in some way. So how do people, um, how is DFT analysis done? you generate a stochastic process. And think about the stochastic process as a Markov chain. And because the failures are typically continuous distributions, I mean, typically a continuous time Markov chain. And there are several approaches, monolithic, compositional. People use base networks or battery nets. Uh, there are several kinds of techniques. So what you do is you basically take your, your fault tree, you generate this stochastic uh, process. And then you use uh, yeah, yeah, classical techniques to analyze this, uh, this model. Uh, there are several myths about those dynamic fault trees. So here I put uh, on this slide two statements from yeah, a rather recent papers, 2015, 2017. Um, let's say basically the first statement says that quantitative analysis of DFTs is quite troublesome, especially of this, if those DFTs are large and complex. And the second statement says, uh, basically, uh, there are many extensions of fault trees, like uh, dynamic fault trees, but the analysis requires a lot of manual of it. Yeah? OK, what I'm trying to, to do in this talk, I'm going to show you that these uh, quotes, I mean, they're basically myths. Um, scalable DFT analysis is possible by doing a combination of all kinds of different techniques, for instance, graph rewriting, but for instance, also model checking. And I'm going to show that that actually uh, leads to quite uh, scalable techniques. So I'm going uh, one by one through this picture uh, through the talk, uh, but this will be the general recipe. So you have a model of the system here on the left. I'm assume, assuming that we model this like a dynamic fault tree. So that's the, basically the, the input to, uh, let's say, our analysis. Then we're going to translate this into a, a continuous time Markov chain. And then we have to specify the property. And then we're going to analyze uh, uh, our model. I mean, basically the Markov chain against the property. And that in the end, hopefully gives you curves like here on the left that tell you basically what is the reliability of my system over the advancement of time. Good. So let's start with this translation. I mean, the step to go from a DFT to such a state space. So I do this by means of a very simple example, this example over here. So we start in the initial state. In the initial state, nothing has failed. So basically, there are two possibilities. But let's suppose that this one will fail. Now, if that is failing, that corresponds to this transition over there. So we end up in the state where only A has failed. Now, there are two possibilities now. Orange or blue will fail. If orange fails, if this one fails, right, then this pant fails. 
uh, and actually this is input to this ore, so then the whole system fails. So that gives rise immediately to a transition to the entire failure of the system. So you see already this F is modeling the failure of the whole system. Uh, one remark, if we go back a bit, uh, if in this setting, rather than the orange element, the uh, let's say the blue element, your replacement tire will fail, then this corresponds to the transition that moves to, uh, to AC. Then you see the whole system did not fail yet. Um, and what you also see is that actually the rate of failure is actually, uh, let's say, uh, diminished by this dormancy factor. And this is a factor which is uh, strictly less than one. And this is basically modeling the fact that uh, this replacement component is not used at the moment. So therefore, it has a lower rate than its real failure rate. OK, so what you get is basically a state space. Yeah. Good. So there are a few issues that you have to keep track of. So actually, when we started looking at those dynamic fault trees, the first thing you have to keep track of is, of course, the semantics. And there are differences. So if you look at the simple picture on the left, and I try to model this by this uh, Petri net on the right with inhibitor arcs, uh, then what you see is suppose that B fails. And now if B's failure is first propagated to X, then actually this will fail. If that's then propagated to this, then actually the left input of this band will fail first. And then you propagate this there and then the right, and then actually this will fail. So if you take this order, then actually if B fails, the whole system will fail. But if you take a different perspective, so if you are basically saying, okay, suppose again B fails, but let's now propagate this arrow first there, and then we go here, this fails, and then we go there, then actually this invalidates this order over here. The right input actually failed before the left one. And this becomes fail safe. That means it will never fail. So actually this already says that, okay, you need to be very careful about how to impose the order. And in terms of a Petronet, I'm going to skip the details, but actually you have those two transitions here and you can impose different priorities that uh, let's say distinguish between these two different orders. So that's an issue that someone has to keep, keep in mind. Another issue is occurring here. Uh, that's non-determinism. So here we have two spare gates, right? And um, yeah, the point is that uh, let's say uh, that we that they share the same uh, yeah uh, replacement. So suppose that uh, the orange one fails. Okay, so that corresponds to this transition over here. Yeah, if the orange one fails, it means that this input here fails. But this orange one is also an input to this OR here on the left. So it also means that this one fails. Okay, so what we have is the spare on the left and on the right are competing for the replacement, namely this. And this is modeled by the non determinism in these light blue states, right? Either let's say the, the right one will claim uh, basically uh, the blue element, yeah, then the whole system actually can still fail. But if the, the left one get the replacement, it means that then if this is going to be used here, this is going to fail. It means this is going to fail. And actually that means that this is going to become fail safe uh, because the right element will never be able to fail. And that means that we go to a situation in which the tree will never fail. So what does this picture mean? A bottom line is the way in which you're going to resolve the non-determinism makes a difference between either the fail state to be reachable or not reachable at all. So if you develop a semantics, you have to be, let's say, very precise on how to resolve these non-deterministic choices or keep them non-deterministic. So actually there are many different semantics for DFTs in the literature. Again, I'm not uh, going into the details, um, the message is that, okay, people have developed this extension of static fault trees, which from a practical point of view uh, was turned out to be useful, but because they increased this expressive power, I mean, they were not very much concerned about the formal semantics. So actually, if you look in the literature, people made different decisions about, for instance, the two issues I just mentioned, and that gives rise to different types of semantics. 
So in 2018, we tried to cover all the existing semantics so far by giving a generic, uh, let's say, Petronet semantics, where actually just uh, two parameters, the way in which you resolve the non-determinism and that you can do by means, for instance, of priorities, um, actually is the only distinguishing feature be between all the other existing uh, existing uh, semantics. Good. Um, so what we did there is actually we used uh, Petronets to capture the meaning of the DFTs. And the way we do that is uh, compositionally. So here you see a, a very simple uh, fault tree on the left with uh, four elements. What you basically do, and that's the pattern, the basic scheme in the middle, uh, you, you develop a patronet for A, you develop a patronet for B, and you glue them in some sense together. And this gluing together is done by those uh, failed places over there in the middle. And if you do this, uh, then you actually get uh, patronets after some simplifications on the right. So you can do this in a, in a fully compositional manner. I'm going to, to skip the details here. I can make the slides, I will make the slides available afterwards. So if people are interested, then uh, definitely uh, I'm willing to do that. So this is how those uh, patronets uh, look like a bit. Maybe I just uh, mentioned one example. Let's look at this uh, priority end here on the left. So this is supposed to model uh, such a priority end, right? Which has uh, uh, in total uh, n children. So those n children can fail. Those are the places that you see here at the bottom. Uh, and now what it needs to be done is uh, basically, uh, you have to have an order of failure uh, from left to right. Um, so if this one fails first, right, um, then th there is a token there. And uh, actually what you can see is that, uh, yeah, what you need to do is basically in order for this one to fail, there needs to be a token in, token in all those input places. Um, so that's uh, like an end. And now the only thing that you have to model is basically if the ordering in which those children's fail contradicts the ordering that is imposed by the priority end, then you have to fail. So that's what you see here. Suppose this one fails first, right? Uh, then actually uh, this transition can fire because there is no token in the left thing. There is no token in fail safe. So it basically means there will be a token over here. And then you see already what happens as soon as there is a token here, I mean, uh, the, there can never be a token in the failed state because actually uh, this transition will be disabled. Okay, so the semantics of such a thing, you can capture this, for instance, by a Petronet. Now, the analysis of these fault trees turned out to be not the main bottleneck. The main bottleneck is actually the state space generation. So the generation of, let's say, a Markov chain out of such a fault tree. And I'm going to show you two approaches. One is compositional and the other one is monolithic. So let's first look at this compositional translation. And the way we're going to do that is to use uh, a notion like uh, what is called a probabilistic uh, bisimulation. And let me illustrate this by means of a very simple example. This is a very simple, actually discrete time Markov chain that models a game and this game is called uh, Krebs. The very specifics of this game are not so very important, um, but it's basically you roll, you roll two times a die and uh, or actually repeatedly a die and either you end up with success, the green state, or you end up with a, a loss of your game uh, in the red state. And now what you see is uh, if you look carefully to those two states, those states are uh, yeah almost similar, right? They have a self loop with probability uh, 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 three quarters. They both have a transition that goes to green with one over 12. And if you look carefully, they both have a transition over here to the red state with one over six. Now, actually it turns out that state four and 10 are probabilistic by similar. The probability to go to move to, let's say another equivalence class, I mean, either being the green state, the red state or their, themselves is actually the same. And that means that actually you can uh, uh, combine those two states. Uh, the same applies here, the same applies to them. So actually you can also obtain a model like this and you can prove that this is by similar to the model on the left. Now, how can we use this in, in state space generation? Well, the idea is the following and that's the, the main property I like to point out. And this is that this actually, this bisimulation turns out to be a congruence with respect to parallel composition. 
So that means that if I know that I have two models that are bisimilar, and now I put them into context, let's say with a new component, the green component, then uh, putting the red component in context with the green component is then bisimilar with putting the blue component in parallel with the green component. And the good thing is that you can compute, so you can compute those, let's say, quotients on the bisimulation using standard partition refinement algorithms. And thanks to Paige Bardian, you can do this logarithmically in the number of states. So this was basically the intuition to do a kind of compositional minimization. Uh, suppose that this is your system, a bunch of components. And now what you want to do is you want to minimize. Now we know that we have this congruence property, and now we can exploit this comp uh, congruence property by doing a component-wise minimization. So what does that mean? We arbitrarily pick a component, let's say this component. We minimize it, so you replace this component by mi uh, with its quotient, and then by the congruence property we know that the whole system again is bisimilar to the original one, and now you repeat this. Yeah? And then at some point you're going to minimize these kind of pairs, uh, and then you repeat this until you have basically minimized the whole system. Uh, the ordering in which you take, for instance, the pairs and in which you take the components may make a difference if you look at the peak memory consumption. And actually the, uh, finding this optimal ordering is NP complete. So people have looked at some heuristics that say, uh, intuitively speaking, uh, if I have, let's say two strongly synchronizing components, then actually you should try to minimize them first because the behavior is one of one component is respecting the behavior of another one quite severely. Now, this idea has been lifted to dynamic fault trees in 2010, and this works as follows. So you have a fault tree on the left, and now what you do is you generate for each fault tree a state space. Okay, that's, so that's my picture over here. And now what you're going to do is the following. You now basically go to uh, a kind of iterative uh, thing. You're basically going to, uh, let's say, minimize. So for instance, you, you by some heuristic, you select uh, this component. You say, let's minimize this. So now we get this component. You plug it into the context. You know that the fault tree or the state space on the right is by similar to the one on the left. And now you do this iteratively. So now what you do is now basically, maybe you're going to compose those two that gives you a state space that you want to minimize and so forth until you have minimized the whole tree and that will give rise to this thing. And this turned out, this very simple strategy turned out to be very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, effective. So here you see the results of the Galileo tool, the original tool for fault trees. And here you see the tool that uses this uh, compositional generation. Um, and one thing that uh, what you see is for instance here, uh, this is uh, 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 an example uh, that is scalable. It's uh, some kind of fault tolerant uh, system. And what you see is that this is the number of states that Galileo uh, determines in a number of transitions. And this is the outcome and the amount of time in seconds to generate this. And using this compositional approach, this could be reduced to, let's say, the peak memory consumption uh, reduced by one order of magnitude, actually a bit more, and also the number of transitions. And actually this amount of time was reduced let's say from this amount to that amount. And actually uh, you see already that here we got a mem out for five, but uh, these people were even able to deal also with increasing things. So this is what uh, Pepin Kruzen, Maria Lestuniga and some other people did, and it turned out to be quite useful. So in 2010, this was basically the state of the art. But um, then we looked into, uh, let's say a monolithic approach because this compositional approach, this looks very nice, but it's uh, very fine grained because in particular for every component, you basically build uh, such, uh, 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 let's say state space. But of course you need some extra states in order to be able to glue things together. I remember my places in the Petronet where I, where I had to introduce extra places in order to be able to glue the sub Petronets together. Now the same phenomenon occurs here. So then people were looking at a monolithic approach where again, they were using this by simulation minimization, but not compositional, just monolithic. And they were basically having the idea, well, if I have a fault tree like this, yeah, and suppose that I know that this part has already failed, 
And uh, if I know that that one has failed, it may be the case that then, for instance, investigating this part of the fault tree becomes redundant because it will not affect, let's say, the failing behavior um, above this red part. So this you can say, this can become don't care, right? Once we know that the red part has failed. So that actually uh, may give rise to a state space reduction. The next, uh, I would say, simple observation is, why don't we try to use uh, symmetries in the fault tree? Yeah, so exploit symmetric structures in your graph in order to be able to uh, yeah, profit from this in the state space generation. And the last concept, and that actually was a concept developed by Dugan herself, um, is to use modularization. And that basically means if you are having subtrees that you can analyze compositionally, so it's analysis, right? Not just state space generation, then please do so. And that these techniques together actually are very profitable. So maybe I should just show you uh, one example this is exploiting this symmetric structure. So if you look at the dynamic fault tree on the left, it's pretty symmetric, right? And this means, for instance, that it's not necessary to, let's say, distinguish whether A or B has failed. I mean, so if you would, uh, let's say, draw the whole state space, you would say, well, either A can fail with some rate alpha or B can fail with some rate alpha. But because it's symmetric, you basically can capture this by a single transition with actually the sum of the rates. The fact that you can take the sum of the rates is actually a property of uh, exponential distribution. And the same applies, let's say, if C fails first, then you are in this state. Again, you may distinguish between either A fails now or B fails. Actually, it doesn't matter because the system is symmetric. So you just can uh, do this. So by doing, uh, let's say, symmetry reduction, this, this don't care propagation, where basically you ignore certain subtrees when they become irrelevant, um, and using this modularization, you can actually uh, improve the situation quite a bit. So this is indicated by those two scatter plots. Um, so what you should keep in mind is these are both lock, lock scale. So lock on the X and lock on the Y axis. So maybe we look at the, the plot on the left, which is the runtime in seconds. So if I would have a point on the diagonal, right? It would mean that uh, let's say this, this uh, let's say monolithic approach, which is here versus the compositional approach I showed you there is equally fast. Okay. Every point which is on this line means that you are 10 times faster. One order of magnitude. This is two orders of magnitude first faster. And uh, well, you can imagine that uh, here you have something like uh, three orders of magnitude and so forth. So what you see that this actually gives quite a drastic improvement, uh, showing that this um, compositional approach is, yeah, elegant, but it's a bit too fine granular. The memory consumption sometimes is better. That's what you see here. This means that the memory consumption of this compositional approach is better than in the monolithic approach. But there are also many cases in which actually the memory consumption of the monolithic approach is better. Um, maybe I should explain what is uh, MO and TO, memory out and time out. It means actually that if there is a point over here, it means that uh, the compositional approach uh, had a timeout, uh, whereas the uh, uh, monolithic approach has not. And if there is a point here, it means that you get a mem out simply because your memory consumption is too high in the composition. Good. Now this was uh, the translation. Now we get into the, the fault trees themselves and to order to simplify them. So the idea is to simplify fault trees by using rewriting and actually graph rewrite. So here the idea was before we do the translation, would it be maybe possible to do a simplification of those fault trees? No. If the fault tree would be a static fault tree, this simply means you're basically minimizing Boolean circuits. But here, because the temporal orderings take place, this is not maybe as simple. So you basically have to find uh, rewrite rules. So here the idea is to simplify those fault trees before you analyze. And uh, the, uh, the thing we can do here is to use graph rewrite. So a very simple example, you see this uh, ant element, this light blue element in the middle, and you quite quickly see that this is actually redundant. So you could simplify the picture on the left, and this is just a logical, uh, let's say, reduction right to the picture on the right. 
And this preserves actually uh, things like uh, reliability or the mean time to failure. So then the idea is that it suffices now to analyze, to build a state space for this DFT and analyze that DFT. So here you see uh, an example of uh, actually the same uh, system we had before. Um, here, actually, this is an alternative notation for those dependencies. So actually, you can simplify this picture a bit. So here, the idea is that uh, if these either one of those fails, then actually both they will fail. So they are a kind of direct cause that if this one fails, those two will also fail. And actually, this is equivalent to have a model like this, where you see that the dependency between the two subcomponents here has been deleted. And you just have this, and they turn out to be equivalent. And now you can simplify this a bit further because uh, this is simply an OR. So you can push this OR one level up. So this gives you a system like this, and so forth. You can do the same for pens, priority ends, priority ORs, and other elements. Um, so here you see an example which is perhaps a little bit less obvious. So on the left hand side, you see a priority end. This priority end has two inconsistent orderings, right? By one ordering, it says basically B has to occur before C. And the other ordering says that C has to occur before B, which is of course inconsistent. So by rewriting in the first step, we rewrite this to the DFT in the middle. Then by another rewrite step, you see that for instance, this band over here is replaced by an ordinary end at the expense of basically pushing down in the tree depends, and that's what you introduce over here. And then another rewrite rule says, yeah, now they become inconsistent. So that means that this A, the root, let's say of my tree on the left can never fail. So in a few rewriting steps, we have simplified this fault tree on the left to this fault tree on the right. So what we did is uh, we developed uh, 29 rewrite rules um, and uh, we analyzed this uh, with uh, this uh, uh, actually DFT calc tool, this tool that used this compositional approach using this uh, uh, graph tool by Arend Hensing, a uh, groove. So we, uh, we modeled actually uh, all the rewrite rules in groove and actually we introduced a mechanism in groove using some heuristics that says, if I now give you as input a fault tree, which part of the fault tree I'm going to basically reduce first. So the reduction order, the rewrite order was determined, uh, let's say by some uh, heuristics in, in groove. And it turns out that we could solve uh, uh, 27 more examples uh, when we were using rewriting uh, compared to the case where we were not using this rewriting. So actually this, this paid off a lot. And again, you see this explicitly made here in the two scatter plots, one on the left on time and the other one on the memory footprint. And actually uh, what you see is that actually, uh, again, uh, we were able to show that uh, we, got, we got a substantial speed up. And in particular, we were able to handle all these examples that could not be handled before. And also in terms of state space, you see that uh, we were able now to handle all these. So this rewriting actually paid off also quite substantially. Um, now you may ask yourself, okay, you have all these rewrite rules. How, you, how do you prove that these are sound? Um, now, this can be done uh, manually, but actually we did an effort to actually do this uh, mechanized way and we were using fear improving for doing that. So how does that work? So we used whole four and we used those uh, gates basically on the ordering. I'm not going to, to all the details, but basically you have a kind of operator that says that one thing should happen before the other one. And you can move this, uh, you can, let's say, describe this in terms of whole, in terms of this, uh, this lambda term. Then what we have to do is uh, we have to model all possible gates, right? So uh, what we have is basically, well, uh, if you have a, a simple end gate, you basically model this by a max. Uh, if you have an nary end gate, so an end gate with n children, you model this by a list and you use some kind of folding uh, where you basically apply, let's say the end on a whole list and so forth. And finally, you also have to basically, uh, now you can model the, the rules by uh, basically, uh, yeah, also using uh, these lambda terms. Um, 
So that's the rule that says, okay, uh, if I have an and and an or, you can simplify this to an x. So this commutativity and distributivity is directly modeled by means of a rule in HOP4. And finally, is that some of the rewrite rules are actually subject to context restrictions. So for instance, the rule I showed you before that simplifies this picture by basically saying there is an inconsistent ordering between B and C. So then you can reduce it to this picture. But this is uh, subject to the fact I showed you this when uh, basically for the case where B and C were basically events, so just uh, circles. But if these are, let's say, entire subtrees, you have to be a bit careful because those uh, subtrees need to be independent. Um, and these context restrictions were also formalized in, in whole. So all gates, all rewrite rules, and the context restrictions uh, formalized in, in, in whole. And then we were able to actually uh, give a formal proof for uh, 22 uh, of our rewrite rules um, using a whole script of about uh, 1,500 lines of whole code. And this was developed, I, I would say, rather quickly, uh, roughly about two weeks of uh, manual development to, uh, to put this all into whole four to prove actually that uh, a substantial amount of rules that we have actually are indeed, uh, indeed sound. Good. Um, the properties we describe in terms of temporal logic uh, and temporal logic that can also say something about uh, probabilities. So uh, in, together with industrial companies, we looked at different kinds of properties that uh, actually uh, those industrial partners wanted to, to specify. So maybe I, I, I gave, uh, give one example. So maybe we look at, uh, at this example over here. Uh, this basically says, okay, I'm interested in the probability that my system uh, will uh, reach uh, uh, a failed state, but uh, you should uh, uh, reach that failed state without first going through what they call a deg degraded state. Uh, you can imagine that a failed state, for instance, means 10 components have failed. A degraded state means something like uh, these specific four subcomponents have failed. And then you are maybe interested in what's the probability of uh, failing, so 10 components failing, without those four specific components never fail. And this is what they call failure without degradation. Um, so actually what we do is that this is what the engineer has to specify. And uh, these model checking queries are then, let's say, underneath, hidden by the engineer. Uh, but this is what we do in order to check the problem. Good. And how do we analyze? We analyze this by a technique called uh, probabilistic model checking. So once we have, let's say, this Markov chain, once we have this temporal logic property, there we're using, I would say, rather standard off-the-shelf probabilistic model checking techniques. Um, I like this slogan in this paper by uh, Alu, Hensing, and Vadi a few years ago in the ACM SIGLOG, where they say that probabilistic model checking is actually uh, an interesting direction because it basically combines system performance uh, with, with correctness. Um, so what we do is basically, this is the rough scheme. Um, in our case, we have a system and, and this is a kind of a full tree, right? We have a requirement that is this temporal logic formula. So in our case, this is a reliability requirement. And this, uh, we have generated this uh, Markov chain after doing the graph rewriting, after doing, let's say, symmetry reduction, don't care propagation, and so forth. And now we put this into the model checker, and the model checker will either give you a result or even give curves like here, or it will provide you with a counterexample that says, ah, there is a sub Markov chain. And, and because of this sub Markov chain, this is a kind of critical component that uh, actually makes your system not satisfying the reliability constraint. And what is underneath is a lot of graph algorithms, automata theory, but in particular also numerical techniques like solving systems of linear equations, linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, and so forth, in order to get this result. Okay, I'm skipping this slide. Um, so what we built is, uh, is a model checker. The model checker is called Storm. If you want, you can, uh, let's say, download this here. And what it has is has several input formats. So one of the input formats natively are those whole trees. 
Then we built this model. So here you can do the simplification with the graph rewriting by simulation minimization, uh, symmetry reductions, all these kinds of things on the poultry. And then uh, what is inside is basically this big, yeah, internal, uh, yeah, I would say catalog of all kinds of, uh, let's say, modules that are able to solve your Markov chain. Yeah. And this is about to give you an indication about 170,000 lines of C++ code. So that's an enormous engine using a lot of sub tools. So for instance, in order to solve systems or binary equations, of course, we use off the shelf solvers to do that. Um, if we use uh, satisfiability modular theory techniques, we use off the shelf as in heat solvers and so forth. If you're interested in this, uh, you can uh, go to the website. And uh, one thing that I would like to point out is that this tool comes with a Python interface. And that means that if you're interested in one of the components, for instance, you're interested in decision diagrams and you want to build something on top of this, then you can just invoke this component via this Python interface so that you can build your own, uh, your own stuff there. Um, one uh, slide that gives a bit of PR um, there have been two competitions between probabilistic model checkers um, in 2020 and 2019. And what you see here is, uh, is a plot that on the x-axis uh, gives an indication how many uh, problem instances could be solved. And on the y-axis, you, you see that actually the amount of time uh, that actually was, was used to, uh, to solve this uh, I see that my time is, uh, is uh, running a bit up, so I'm going to make a jump because I want to indicate to you one, ex one um, let's say, illustration of a real life application uh, study. And this is the criticality ass assessment of railway stations. So here you see a railway station of uh, a city in Germany, Mönchengladbach. And the idea is that you see all kind of, uh, let's say, elements over here. And these elements can fail. And now trains are routed, for instance, from this direction to that direction. And maybe you're interested in, let's say, the criticality of, for instance, this switching element, or maybe of this signal over there. So this was approached by actually taking this infrastructure data. There is a standard format used by people in railway engineering. This was all modeled by all kinds of fault trees. So this was completely, let's say, automated. We also use this uh, rewriting. We used actually partial state space generation and then actually input this into this uh, model checker. And uh, we apply this to, um, to different railway stations. Again, I'm skipping the details, but uh, what maybe is appealing to you is uh, what are the sizes of the fault trees that you get? Um, well, here you see, for instance, an example, a fault tree with uh, 500 uh, uh, events. Uh, uh, 50 events, 50 gates that are dynamic and 450 gates which are static. So these are the OR and the AND gates that you can analyze, let's say, by BDDs. But you see quite a substantial amount of those, uh, let's say, dynamic elements, about 50 here. Um, the number of states of the state space and the number of transitions. Uh, and uh, actually, this is the amount of time to build the state space. Uh, then the analysis actually is relatively fast much, much faster. We're talking about uh, maybe uh, 10 seconds, uh, but it's the state space, which is basically, and that's what I mentioned before, is the bottleneck. So that's why we were so much interested in techniques like rewriting, by simulation, minimization, symmetry reductions, and so forth, because that actually turns out to be the bottleneck. And then what you get is at the end, you get those heat maps. So same, uh, let's say, uh, uh, snapshot of the uh, uh, railway station of Mönchengladbach, and uh, the colors of the switching elements indicate, let's say, the criticality of those things. And this is then completely uh, automatically generated uh, using uh, the analysis techniques that I showed you. So let me, uh, let me wrap up. Um, although in the literature, there are several, I would say, myths about uh, dynamic fault trees, um, I think, I hope that I have give you a glimpse that uh, using, uh, let's say, formal verification techniques, and in particular, using clever state space generation techniques, uh, allows you to, uh, to analyze these kind of uh, large scale models. Um, this is what I actually showed you. Uh, the part that I skipped is uh, this part. Uh, intuitively, what you do is they iteratively generate more and more of the state space and then analyze them. That means you get bounds. 
and not precise values. Uh, but that is helpful if you're not able to generate a full state space. Good. So this completes my talk. Um, using this technique, we're able to analyze more safety measures, not just the classical measures on fault trees. We can handle a larger class of fault trees. It's typically substantially faster and it's fully automated. I'd like to thank my co-authors. Um, and if you're interested in the, the literature in my talk, I used actually material from, from several talks. So if you are interested in the graph rewriting, and then I, uh, I can recommend you this, uh, this paper over here in uh, formal aspects of computing. Thanks for your attendance and I'm happy to take questions.